Hello, everybody. Welcome back to the podcast. Today, I'm joined by another lovely person. Um, well, what can I say? She's got some very cool um, titles to introduce her. She's uh, the daughter of the godfather of cultivated meat in the Netherlands. And she's the founder of Kinda Tech, a company which she'll tell you all about. And she's got a very cool sounding last name. I'll uh, let her tell you all about her name, about the work she does and about her life and um, how we met and why we're on the Sophie Dow show together. So without further delay, please welcome Ira Van Elen. Ira, how are you? I'm fine. It's nice weather here in the Netherlands. Uh, it's the fall. Um, we have some sunny weather here. And I, this morning, the weather was well good enough for me to jump overboard and have a <laughs> swim in the harbor. Hey, that's you know, the thing I find about Europeans is that the weather is, I remember visiting my cousin in Switzerland and she's and a lot of people there. And I've noticed wherever in Europe you go, the, the weather is a big thing uh, in your conversation, right? Because <laughs> in India, it's almost like it's hot, it's hotter, it rains. And it's, but it, I mean, of course, we talk about the weather because we kind of are influenced by it, but not as much as Europeans are. <laughs> and is that because of the fluctuating kind of nature of your weather? I think so. Uh, right. I'm fortunate enough to live in a country where we are, where we used to have four seasons. Right. So a really good winter, uh, a spring, uh, a, a hot summer and a fall. Mm. And um, yeah, so it changes. It fluctuates. That distinction's gone now? Or is, is it less distinct? Is that what you're saying? It's, it is changing. Ah. It is changing. Weather uh, in the winter isn't as severe as it used to be. And mm. our summers are sometimes scorching hot. Um, uh, but still fall and spring, that remains. And it's, it's both beautiful. You know, growing up, um, I've never, you know, I've never visited. Uh, that's one of the few countries. I mean, many countries I haven't visited, but in Europe, I haven't been to the Netherlands. Of course, you know, growing up, there's so many things you hear about the Netherlands, which are the windmills. Um, you hear about the the city of dikes, and of course, back when I was growing up, city of dikes just meant the the physical dikes that prevent the water coming in and of course you hear about you know the the the, the flowers that come from the netherlands and and as you grow older the the stories change it's about it's about your access to the the, the smoke parlors and all sorts of various adult things but you know this there's a, there's an entire sort of cultural context which you only sort of understand once you get to the country or get to the city in that country. So how, for you, how has it been? I mean, of course, you travel with your work, which, which we'll get to in a bit. But how, how has being um, a, a Dutch person influenced your outlook? I mean, maybe it's too vast a question, but has, are there certain traits or certain things in your life that have brought you so far to where you are as, as a person from the Netherlands influenced your outlook on the environment and outlook on consumption or outlook on since you're in the space, food? Yes, definitely. Okay. Uh, it, it, to be quite honest, in such a way that I sometimes can't even get away from it. Uh -huh. uh, I am, I am, I'm from Amsterdam. I was born in Amsterdam. Mm. Uh, I'm very lucky to be a, a person from Amsterdam. Right. And uh, whenever I travel abroad, and I've done that a lot, and even with my parents as a child, we used to live in other countries within Europe. And um, but especially when I go to the States, mm -hmm. I notice that I am extremely European, and ah, okay, um, okay. <laughs> I am used to the European way of uh, around people. Which and, would be what in a few, like, like a few well, European one, traits. One of, that one of the things that bothers me when I go to the States mm -hmm. is that they are used to having um, people lying in the streets and uh, begging. And, and for us, that for me, that is something I can't get used to. And mm -hmm. um, you mean and, the homeless people, as they call yes. them, right? Yeah. Um, and to it, to for me, it takes some effort to actively ignore them ah, uh, right. <laughs> uh, but would that be because you're also from one of the more affluent or smaller european countries because there are if you go to like the bigger ones now where they have a lot of the i don't know if it's the right word but the immigration crisis where you have a lot of um if they call it a crisis but a lot of the people living in sort of ghettos as the name i mean all these are just names given but um do you have this kind of perspective because you're more protected would it be 
Yes, um, we have a social construct in within our country mm -hmm. that we always nag about because the politicians never do their job right and uh, we're never uh, <laughs> satisfied. Right. If you look at it, we we have a very affluent country, and mm -hmm. what I like about it is that, in a sense, if you make a mistake in this country, you do something wrong, mm -hmm. uh, it is never one strike out. Uh, whereas ah. in other countries, if you somehow um, have a problem, mm -hmm. whether that's mental or financial or uh, or you just have bad luck, yeah, it is never one strike. It is it is usually one strike out. So you're, right. you're suddenly a homeless person, or you're right. suddenly right. Uh, a poor person, or you don't have any ah. chances anymore. So you have more, more of a safety in, net in in, in yeah. In and we topic. have we have a social construct, and we pay a lot of tax for it, uh, mind you, but. Um, so if you want to be a homeless person in the Netherlands, you really have to do your best. <laughs> right. No, I think that's and 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 that, and, is, and 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 I still think even in our country we can do a better job, and where yeah. there are still people missing out. So I'm not trying to say that if you have a problem here in my country, it's all your fault. I'm not saying that. Yeah, 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 yeah. But our social network is in such a way uh, set up that, um, yeah more people get a chance to get out of trouble if they want to or if they can. You know, I like that approach uh, because I feel there's, um, you know, with especially since you mentioned America and since everyone talks about it as the go-to or the model to, to sort of follow, I think no. with Europe itself, there's a little bit more responsibility. And of course, I can't speak of for all Europeans in the whole of Europe, no. but there's a little bit more sensibility and sensitivity to the fact that, you know, it takes all to make a country and it takes all to make a society and not everyone's going to be a Jeff Bezos. So not everyone's going to be uh, the, the most sort of philanthropic, uh, philanthropic, ugh, I can't say the word, uh, the most generous kind of donor like a Warren Buffett. Um, I don't know why I use big words on the podcast. Anyhow, uh, but this idea of taking care of everyone's health to make sure that you have access to um, you know, a healthcare system, which might not be the most efficient, but you at least have a basic dignity of getting healthcare services, a basic access to food, a basic access to housing, and these things which just make the basic society a little bit more of a nicer place. And then, of course, you know, each person can reach their maximum potential and become rich or whatever the thing may be. But this is something that you see more in Europe than North America, and maybe even in, in Asia. And I think that's a really cool sign of progress because of course it's, it's as you said it's all black white and gray but it's not all good but it's it's a nice thing and that that leads me to asking you in, uh, why you got into the space because you mentioned about your father starting this back in the 70s and it's such an important thing which people talk about when it comes to just what they eat like when it comes to you know, I'm a vegan versus I'm a meat eater I'm on this <laughs> diet I'm on that diet but how, how uh, important was that um, thing that your dad did in shaping your decision to get into the space of food and um, how has that been since you were young and till date? Well, um, what is particular is that um, my father was born in Indonesia. So mm -hmm. even though I'm a typical uh, North European blonde woman mm -hmm. and my father was a tall blonde guy, uh, he was born in Indonesia, brought up by uh, uh, um, in the, the in an Asian sphere. But by um, Dutch parents, right? By Dutch parents right, right. who were very, <laughs> who were quite extraordinary people in their, in their own rights. Uh -huh. And I think... Um, so I was brought up in the Netherlands by someone who didn't feel very much at home in the Netherlands because okay. he sort of, after the Second World War, had to flee back to the Netherlands mm -hmm. and came into a country where he had never lived in his life. It was cold. It was, here's the weather again. Uh, and it was not his home country. Yeah. Um, and that's and, quite a drastic change, Indonesia to the Netherlands, right? At the yes. Yeah, yeah. Yes. And um, there is a very special word in Indonesian, and it's called adat. And that's a, a, a way of doing things. And my father's way of thinking and way of doing things was very Asian, uh -huh. which uh, most people in the Netherlands found peculiar. And um, of course, he managed and, and lived his life in the Netherlands, never went back to Indonesia because he was afraid 
that it would not be the country that he envisioned or uh, wanted to dream uh, about. So he never went back. Oh, so he never went back after leaving from after no. World War II. Oh, wow. Okay. No, no. And, um, and, if, uh, and I am brought up on an Asian diet. So for me, eating rice in the morning instead of bread uh, was the norm. Uh, so mm, even I was for a person from Europe, you know, it's, 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 yes. it's, it's strange. In fact, like if you, if you meet someone and, and, they, and I think a lot of people were like, why, why would you do rice? That's seen as something more, um, as an exotic kind of breakaway from, you know, tradition. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Maybe you eat rice for dinner, but never for lunch or, or, uh, or, uh, Breakfast, and, yeah. and having a warm soup in the morning. That's also weird mm. in the Netherlands. So even I was brought up in a different way from my, let's say, uh, fellow children. Uh -huh. And, um, the other thing that my father brought into, uh, my, uh, let's say way of doing things is that you always have to have enough food when people come around mm -hmm. you you have you have to have too much food <laughs> otherwise yeah. you're not polite i recognize Whereas that in the netherlands yeah. if you if you come for dinner you get a certain amount of food and that's it so yeah so i'm european and mm -hmm. i'm also sort of brought up in an asian fashion hey, you've so, got some really really good uh <laughs> traits from around the world because I, you know, I heard the story, my uncle went uh, to Switzerland and they offered him and you know, in, in, in India, and I'm sure you've seen this and heard this even in other Asian um, traditions, when someone says no, uh, when they say when you offer them food, and they say and you say and they say no, you say no, no, you must have some you must have some. But the Swiss, when you say no, they actually say it's a it's a cold no. So he's like, No, no, I don't want any expecting them to say yeah, have some more. And he went hungry for three nights, because yeah. they never asked him again. So no, 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 I, I, it is the so the so the whole adat, which uh -huh. is this Indonesian word is 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 weird. Mm. So, um, uh, and it, it is a constant in, in, in my life that yeah. I do things differently from my fellow European, mm -hmm. uh, Europeans and also, uh, speaking my mind about stuff, uh, mm -hmm. sometimes feels impolite because I don't want to be rude to someone else, mm. even though I have very, very strong opinions, yeah. um, Ventilating my Clubhouse strong opinions, opinions. Yeah. <laughs> is, is is somehow uh, really something I have to strive for, right. and also was a difference between my father. Um, not saying it is the right way, but it is uh, sort of, yeah, explaining it how is what it is. Yeah, it I is what that's... it is. Yeah. And going back to how I finally got into the work that my father started, mm -hmm. I was a teenager when my father started talking about cultivated meat right and for those who don't know what cultivated meat is it means you take a stem cell from an animal uh -huh. that stays alive uh, make sure so the animal stays uh, well and alive uh -huh. you take a stem cell that's uh, taking a sort of biopsy is taking a, a sesame seed uh, a sized uh, piece of meat out of an animal okay so a living uh, with tissue, a basically. needle so it's living tissue out of that uh, you take a stem cell and then out of the stem cells you grow meat without having to use the animal so you feed the cells like we're used in medical uh, treatments all over the world and uh, in 1980 when i was 14 my father suddenly started talking about this saying this this would be the solution for world hunger, uh, animal abuse, uh, uh, CO2 exhaust uh, problems. He knew all of that. So when I was 14, wow. I already was taught by my father that we would need four planets to feed the world if we, we would remain eating meat as we did. Mm -hmm. I knew of all the effects of meat and um, uh, food consumption as we did. So that was that's something i was brought up with so oh, that's currently it's very fashionable to talk about it but i so i very often find myself like yeah okay yeah, now you're starting to talk yeah. about it and that's what i <laughs> want to get to you know because okay my, it's it's first of all there's so many things that uh i think need to be covered when i mean just from my curiosity right um because you hear all these things now suddenly it's it's the it's the in thing to be a vegan and talk about yeah. factory farms and you're like <laughs> oh my god it's, it's a horrible what's going on to the i mean of course it's it is sad and i think people are aware that this has been going on but 
Um, you know, you come from, I mean, of course, as you said, you're not a typical European or a typical person from the Netherlands, but what is a typical diet when it comes to a balance of, say, carbs and, you know, like, say, vegetables, proteins? What is a typical Dutch diet, if, that, if that's even a thing? <laughs> well, uh, Dutch cuisine, I think, should be said, doesn't exist. Um, oh, okay. um, but on the other hand, what is really funny mm -hmm. is in, for instance, a city like Amsterdam, we have 182 nationalities living here. Mm. So if you come to Amsterdam, you have an array of food to choose from, right. whether it's Indonesian, Chinese, Thai, uh, but also all kind of countries are from Africa mm. or uh, you can eat here. So it we have very good food here in Amsterdam. Um, but the Dutch cuisine is you have a sandwich in the morning, you take a couple of sandwiches to your work. Um, in the evening, you have, of course, a piece of meat, some potatoes uh, and uh, vegetables. Vegetables are not grilled, but cooked. Mm -hmm. uh, afterwards, you have a sweet, uh, like a tutje, and, and mm -hmm. that's it. That's what you do. Mm -hmm. um, um, rice is not something very common in the Dutch, uh, um, but these days things are different. So that is, yeah. let's say, cuisine 20 years ago. Since 20 years, we've come a long way. We eat er practically everything. Mm. We eat a lot. And in a country well educated like the Netherlands, um, sadly, we've been eating more meat last year than the year before. So Why even is though, that? Because I've noticed that in India, but of course, India compared to the Netherlands is a very different scenario because we're being certainly yeah, exposed to new kinds of food and also with a stronger middle class, more people getting money. I think people also want to spend. And when I grew up, say, in the 90s, when I was in my in my teens in the 90s, like getting a burger, it wasn't even a beef uh, patty, it was just chicken for the most part or lamb. That was like a novelty and that would happen once in three, four months. Literally, I think there were three places in Bangalore which had a burger slash the burger patty sandwich, whatever. But now, literally with companies, we have delivery companies like, you know, like the 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 Swiggies, it's called like Deliveroo and they have in, in the UK. These these opportunities for people to eat like, you know, a, a, a bacon, lettuce, tomato, a baguette or eat like a pepperoni pizza or eat like a like a like a filet mignon. The, I mean, it's just that much more access to meat. And I'm specifically sticking to meat because that's what you sort of are, are, are focusing on with this uh, with this cultivated meat. And I want to get into that a benefit and also the, the controversy around it. But how does it look when, um, you know, of course, people, you know, defend meat eating and I'm not an anti meat person. I, I you know, I, I eat meat myself, but my entire diet for most of my life was 99% vegetarian because we didn't cook meat at home because my grandma when she was alive was you know we come we come from these group of people called the brahmins and we're the priests kind of thing we don't we're not supposed to eat meat but all that's changing of course this was when even some people still don't but i'm saying culturally oh, religiously. things are changing that's yeah. a sad thing Oh. And you know, I think back then, I'm saying, of course, the caste system was miserable. I'm sure you know of the caste system, but yep. uh, there's no but in that context. What I mean is, but there were certain people because of religion, because of certain practices, didn't eat certain things. And I'm not saying that's right or wrong. But now, since those 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 walls are breaking, all those barriers are breaking, it's, which is great for for for, for the sort of humanity. But when it comes to food, a lot more people are eating a lot more in general. So yes. what happens then generally? Well, if we eat too much, um, it's bad for our health. Yeah. And mind yeah. you, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm somebody who eats too much, but mm -hmm. I am a vegan. Okay. So okay. you also have big vegans like myself. Okay. Um, I am not against eating meat. I just don't want to eat meat anymore because yeah. One of the main reasons my father didn't want uh, people to eat so much meat was because he couldn't stand the way we were treating animals. Yeah. And um, for instance, all the chickens that we grow in, in the world, they won't grow older than, let's say, two years, mm. whereas the normal lifespan of a chicken is between five to ten years. Um, yeah, it's quite horrific the way even uh, and, I, and, I don't I, know, but yeah. and and a chicken here in Europe is valued when it's a grown chicken, it's valued at nine cents euro cents. My God. Mm. So if so, the main reason for me to 
be an advocate for cultivated meat is not the climate because that is a selfish reason. Mm -hmm. Oh, we have a clock here. I'm on, an, on a boat, and this is a ship's clock that you hear in the background. Oh, wow, you're on, a, you're on a ship. How, yes, I, mean, I live on a boat. Oh, you, okay. I thought you were on a cruise, and you're just taking the time to talk to me. I'm like, why, why would no, you no. talk? Oh, you live on a boat. Okay, cool. I live on a so, boat. And hey, so, that's pretty cool. Yeah, it is. <laughs> Super cool. Wow, okay. I'm um, getting a guest from a boat. Uh, that's really cool. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So what I wanted to say is... Um, for me, cultivated meat is important not because we uh, sort of want to have uh, all of these uh, climate change uh, mm -hmm. happening. No, I just simply want people to eat meat that doesn't mean a dead animal. Well, but okay, I'm I'm going to play devil's advocate. You know, I'm 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 not going to yeah, be sure. a person who's um, you know going to just. Okay, I'll tell you what it is. For me, I've never seen an animal being slaughtered for meat, right? In fact, I heard a chicken being killed once and it really upset me. I'm Now, I'm not saying this because of the vegans listening to this or the non-vegans or the people going, oh man, how can you not hear it? It's it's part of nature. We always kill them for meat, whatever. I'm just saying this from my personal experience. I've never done it. I've never sort of killed an animal to eat it. I've never seen one or heard one except for that incident with the chicken. Uh, but for me, and what tends to happen is when the meat, uh, say that predominantly for me, when the chicken meat, if it's in a certain preparation, when it doesn't look like meat or if it doesn't taste like meat, I can do it. I can eat it when it's either, you know, cooked in a certain gravy or whatever. But if it's if it looks like a meat, I can't do it. And this is, you know, I'm not a hardcore activist in any of these food spaces, but why haven't we after years and years, you know, I understand our ancestors hunted and they gathered the times are different, but just because we can, why are we doing so much? And the second question to that is after years of, you know, slaughtering meat, why isn't there a better and more humane way of keeping these animals and treating these animals before sending them to slaughter and even a better way of slaughtering them? Oh, uh, well, um, I may be called extreme. I think, I think we, we are technical beings. I, I, I think of humans as technical be beings. We yeah. tend to uh, take techniques that we discover uh, as if it's our second nature. So mm -hmm. even speaking, we've defined speaking in such a way that it's a perfect technique to, for us to communicate. But cooking in itself is a technique. Yeah. Uh, growing crops is a technique that we now find very natural, yeah. where it is something that we... and and. Uh, uh, putting your brain in your uh, 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 in your phone now is second nature to us. I used to know all the phone numbers of everybody I knew. Yeah. Right now, there's only one phone number I knew because I'm a technical be being. I uh, adapt to techniques as if they're mm. in my second nature. Yeah. So yeah. I think in the old days, there was a sort of balance between us taking care of animals Mm -hmm. And animals benefiting by having a longer life with us, staying together with us mm -hmm. and being slaughtered later in life and having their children. And we fenced them in a little bit. We protected the chicken from the fox. And that could be seen as sort of beneficial for both. I know a lot yeah. of people will say, no, you should leave animals alone. And I'm one of those. But yeah. We used our technical way of doing things, uh, perfecting them, uh, making them more efficient. Mm. We used them towards animals. And now yeah. we, we have animals as part of production for food. And that so no took away yeah. every balance for me. And that became horrific that yeah. became something that is detrimental also to the earth yeah. but yeah. mostly to our sense of being a human so if i now work very hard toward towards a better future i hope it is a future where humans don't want to slaughter an animal anymore for food where people will say did we actually slaughter animals to eat meat mm. and for me yeah if 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 I am this polite, maybe slightly Asian kind of person, within me there is a twenty-year-old anger 
that we know how to make meat that we so badly want to eat. Everybody wants to eat meat. We love mm. it. We're hooked on it. Uh, uh, we think we need it. And already, let's say 20 to 30 years, and in my case, 40 years, but let's say 30 yeah. years ago, we knew how to make meat without having to use an animal. Okay. For me, in itself, that would have brought me to say, okay, how can we produce this? How can we make this? How can we grow this industry? But even today, making meat in a different way still has to prove itself, has to be economically viable. And the whole discussion is not like, hey, we can make this and we don't have to use the animal anymore. No, it's like, oh, can it compete with the current uh, uh, meat market and the current way of doing things? And I would like to live in a world where we would like to run away of our own behavior as fast as we can. can. But I have to do my work in a world where I have to convince people that making cultivated meat is a better econo uh, e economic yeah. Uh, uh, future than maintaining uh, what we do to cows and pigs and, and chicken. And believe me, yeah. I, I like uh, a small time farmers. I know they do a good job, but even for them, it is necessary to bring a chicken to slaughter after 89 uh, uh, um, uh, weeks and uh, have a cow uh, brought to slaughter at six instead of 30. And um, that is even with the small time farmers, their business model. And I don't want animals to be a part of a business model. You know, when I read of uh, African tribes, which revere the cow and the, I'm sorry, the, 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 the herders, they're not the cow alone, but the, the bovine uh, species. So, but they, you know, they herd these, these, these huge herds of cows across the grasslands and they, you know, they, of course they eat it, but it's an entire relationship, as you said, in harmony. And they have that even the native Americans did that with, I think the Buffalo. And I think of course everyone ate, but this has become, as you said, it's just become this rootless, um, you know, and, and there's so much, and there's so much waste. And, you know, when, and I'm sure you're aware of this and it sort of makes your, I'm sure it makes your blood boil this whole thing, which happened recently in the Pharaoh's Island, which is just the proof of just because I can, it's kind of this human arrogance going, oh, it's our, it, we're going to defend it because it's our tradition. And, and there's so much wastage. And how, I mean, how, how do you convince these people? Because, you know, when you tell these people, um, you know, it, the, the argument is on either side, right? Like, I mean, also the problem is everyone screaming, no one gets hurt kind of thing. But when you talk of um, cultivated meat, you have all these people going, but it's not real meat. It doesn't taste like my, like my, you know, what's whatever beef uh, steak should be. I'm not really familiar with all the right cuts, but I mean, I, I don't have a question, but where do you start this argument? Where do you start this conversation? Because it's getting more well, and more indiscriminate, the killing, right? Well, the thing is, I, I am sure that it will take a long time for people to be able to uh, eat the perfect 3D steak that, steak that they now think they are eating. Uh -huh. uh, what they don't know is 80% of the meat that we eat is, uh, is, uh, is, is, is either a sausage or a meatball or, uh, a, mm. I don't know, a pasta sauce. Something like right. that. So eighty percent of the meat can be perfectly made from cultivated meat. Mm. If you want the three D steak, and that is how our brains work. So if we talk about meat, we see the three D steak in our mm. minds. We are probably not aware that it's just pre only twenty percent of what we actually eat. If we talk about meat, oh, um, sorry, I didn't get that. What do you mean twenty percent? Twenty percent of the meat that we eat are oh, cuts. as a total. Okay, right. Compared to this, yeah. the, the the cuts or the the sausages, right? Got it. Got it. So, eighty percent is processed meat, canned meat, whatever meat, and uh, something that you put on your uh, sandwich. And mm. uh, only twenty percent of the meat that we it's eat meaty, is meaty. is still looks like what we envision when we talk about meat. Okay, I'm just going to throw in a quick question then, as yeah. as as a person to challenge your cultivated meat argument. Well, okay, sure. um, you know, I rather uh, you say that cultivated meat is good. I, I don't know. I'm sounding like a reporter from uh, one of these <laughs> news channels. All right, Ira, I have a question for you from our listener from Tennessee. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know why it's Tennessee, but but 
okay, if you have cultivated meat, it replaces, it's a great economic um, uh, value. It makes business sense. It's, it's a very good capitalistic approach. But what about all these pigs and chickens and cows, which are already there? What are we going to do about it? They're going to end up eating all the grass. It's going to cause a huge carbon footprint and uh, increase methane levels in the atmosphere. The ozone layer is going to deplete. What is your cultivated meat going to do then? So how would you approach that? <laughs> I, I, I'm, I'm going to be a horrible I will, I, uh, <laughs> person. We, we have currently more animals than people on the world. We have uh -huh. more uh, uh, agriculture animals than wild animals in the world. So wow. hopefully cultivated meat will lead to one thing at least, and that is less animals. And So some uh, people so would say just get rid of those animals then to balance it out, right? Like, don't they do this? I don't know. Do they do this in Europe? But I've heard in America, like in when the deer population or the elk population goes up, they sort of give licenses to cull these animals. So wouldn't these people say, okay, then we're just culling the animals. But sadly, what they don't realize is that more are being born for the consumption. So... I mean, this, I'm a pretty horrible devil's advocate. I'm already leaning towards your no, side. No, 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 yeah, no, no. Ask me any question you like. <laughs> no, what I mean is I you. get your point because I really think that we're eating too much. First of all, whatever we're eating, we're just becoming very gluttonous in our consumption. Just because there is, we're putting it in our faces. And I don't think that's right. I mean, I'm not a person here to govern anyone's eating habits, but it's just disgusting after a point when you see people, I'm sure you, you see it in Europe as well. When we when you clear an entire plate of food like it's normal and eat two hours later again, I'm like, dude, I think you need. I mean, I just think take a step back and real, just figure out what you're putting into yourself. You know? Yeah. Well, I'm very bad at it. Um, no, I'm not saying it's wrong I, or right. I'm I just of, think I, sometimes. No, no, it's mindless. bad. I, I, I'm, 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 I'm far from a saint. Uh -huh. Um, but I just have one habit, and that is that I don't like us to uh, eat meat too much mm. and the worry is um it, it it's in asia and it's it's somehow western culture is something we export very well uh and i hope we will not export the western culinary uh, uh, uh way of consuming meat because currently in asia only 15 percent is uh, animal derived protein mm. And in the Western world, it is between 40 and 60%. Whoa, okay. And the biggest mm. growth in animal protein consumption is expected to derive, to happen in Asia. I mean, it's a hot market for them. I, I can tell by the way even the Amazons and the Walmarts are coming here to India. I mean, my reference point of reference is India, but if you just take India, Korea, you take China, just these three countries, uh, I don't know why I said Korea, but it's big. Uh, it's yeah. just massive, right? Like when I visited Seoul, their meat, I mean, their food is cooked in the middle of the table. It's really, really interesting, but they do have still a lot of like cabbage, their vegetables, but you're right. If, and also because of that, their, their, their certain rituals that govern, like I'll give you an example, like a couple of people, like there are a few groups of people, uh, meat eaters in India, but on Tuesdays and Saturdays, or they have these days of the week where they don't eat meat. And in fact, even traditionally, there are certain people who don't eat on the full moon or the new moon. There's certain names in, in, in religious names or these na days have names because of things, but it was done because the body needs to cl cleanse. They don't eat meat on certain days because they, whatever, they give religious reasons, but there were these practices, but now they're just going and, you know, on a Tuesday night, you can go out and get a steak or Tuesday night, you can go out and get like a buffet. And I'm not just talking veg or non veg food and we have a big thing over here like veg and non-veg but what i get worried about and just resonate your your thoughts on this is it's it's almost become that you know what it's because there are vegans going up and down saying you know animal cruelty in today's sort of climate where people are just on either extreme shouting just because vegans are saying this on the other extreme you have people going you know what just because you're a vegan pissing me off i'm going to eat an extra steak it's almost become that you know yeah yeah it's 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 completely true so that's so in my view i know that we don't need cultivated meat if we just eat uh, uh, uh if everybody would in a way become almost a vegan or a vegetarian this world would be uh bountiful for everybody and we wouldn't have problems but would there but be enough vegetables it is a given sorry would there be enough vegetables for everyone then because that's another argument right 
Well, a, a lot of the corn and soy is currently being fed to animals. So if we right. would that, <laughs> if we would <laughs> have, because do you know what the average uh, energy conversion from an animal is? So you give it a hundred percent of energy, mm -hmm. only f at best fifty percent of the energy comes out. So okay. every time you eat meat. It comes with a loss of almost. Uh, oh, or, you're saying animal protein. Fifty percent. So if okay. I if I feed an animal perfectly okay grains and soy, and and whatever beans, and and I would give it to a human, it could live of it. But the the whole point is that we are feeding our animals, especially here in Europe, perfectly okay grains and and soy and and stuff like that. Mm. And 50% of the energy gets lost. If we would stop that, we could we have enough energy and food in the world to to easily um, and we of course let's say easily uh, feed a growing population. That's not the point. But so because saying, we, feed... we miss out on so much of the food because we feed it to animals. Ah, okay. So I I, I was a little confused. So you're saying when you feed say a cow. For... Uh, all these things which you're giving it, which is grain and protein, you know, sorry, soy, corn, only 50% is coming out as energy, but 50% is wasted. So instead of giving it to the cow, you're saying don't give these cows and don't encourage these factory farms where they're giving these cows this, but give it to humans instead of the meat that they eat, right? Yeah. And then the funny thing about cultivated meat is, and that is something most people probably don't know, if I feed cells 100% of energy, 95 percent of energy comes out so you only have a loss of let's say three to five percent wow that's high yeah no but okay so, what does it taste like i mean what uh, so it's from it's a certain so meat. you take it from uh you take a you take a little stem cell from a cow the meat tastes yeah. like cow you take it from um a pig it tastes like a pig and you can do it with all meats yes i mean I didn't know. I've heard about like I heard that this is something that the guy at Google wanted to do. I think his name is um, is it Ray Kurzweil? I think he wanted to start this bio lab, something like that. But I didn't know that. You know, you know, pardon my okay, ignorance, but I didn't know thirty years back that your dad had done this. Forty years back, that's amazing. Yeah, he started working on it forty years back. He started uh, doing proof of concepts in nineteen ninety three. He wrote pa patents on them in nineteen ninety seven. He got a Dutch grant to do research in 2002. Mm -hmm. um, and from his team, uh, uh, Mark po Post comes and Mark Post showed the world the first cultivated meat hamburger in 2013. So and you eat, then, have you eaten it? I've, uh, no, I've not eaten that hamburger, sadly enough. I wish I would have. Yeah. Uh, but uh, three years ago, I uh, got to eat cultivated meat in, Sing uh, in San Francisco. Uh -huh. at the company named Just, um, and I made friends with Josh Tetrick. And mm -hmm. currently, if you and I would go to si Singapore and go to uh, one of the restaurants there serving cultivated meat, we mm -hmm. could have cultivated chicken. And then you will notice that, yeah, this is chicken as I know it. And I've oh. also had uh, cultivated duck and cultivated uh, foie gras. And um, So this just comes out... Um... Okay, I'm going to sound really stupid when I say this, but it's, <laughs> it's just going to be the meat and you're not going to have the animal being born and then again killing it. It's just the meat that comes out. And, yeah. and what does it resemble? Just like how in the grocery store you have these uh, these fillets of meat? Um, uh, right now you can't buy it because there are regulatory uh, uh, problems uh, or problems or hurdles uh, right now. So in Europe, we can make it, but we can't sell it. Um, the only place right now where it's allowed to produce and eat cultivated meat is Singapore. Ah, okay. And so there you can try it and there you can get it. And um, so you and can buy it in a grocery store, like how you buy, say, four no, breasts of chicken, no, you can buy it. No. Oh, this industry is not at scale yet. So, okay, so uh, when, when do you think it will? Uh, because you said uh -huh. the past five, 10 years have seen significant approvals and growth and uh, proof of concept. So when do you Somewhere think? Somewhere between five to 15 years, um, mm. somebody will have it in a supermarket near you. Wow, okay. But 
why are people so resistant to this? I mean, with, with everything, right? Whether it's shark fin trade or whether it's with, even with what you eat, why is food in some ways, um, one from why, are, why is, is there a mafia in the meat industry? Um, no. Why aren't people able to be able, like, why, why is with everything with, with energy, with, with consumption of, you know, traditional sources of energy, renewable energy, all these things of letting go of past things if from your experience of dealing with people, whether it's executives and corporates or whether it's dealing with changing mindsets and people, why are people so rigid? And do you sense that there is more of this refusal to accept that we need to move forward or they, from my experience, I hear people just saying the right thing that, oh, climate change, animals are cruelty to animals, but how many people are really feeling that need for change? Um, well, most people have uh, a sort of priority system. Mm -hmm. So first, make sure you're a good person. But what decides you're a good person? Probably the things that you've been taught by your parents. Mm -hmm. That decides whether you're a good person. You want to take care of your children, want to make sure that they go to school, mm -hmm. want to build them a house. How do you do that? Mm -hmm. That is by doing a good job within the current system. Mm -hmm. So I can easily persuade people that we have better ways of doing stuff. Yeah. It is very hard for people to convince themselves that they can be actually part of this, that they can mm -hmm. do a different job. And let's say uh, if you have good friends and, and you ha live in a community and everybody goes to the local barbecue and your kids are welcome there and you want them to be socially accepted. Mm -hmm. It is very hard for your family to become suddenly this quaint vegans. Uh, what do you do at the barbecue at, at the end of the week? So it is not that people don't understand that we can do a better job. It mm. is very, very hard for people to have the courage and the possibilities to have a, a sense of safe right. and change because change in itself is is scary is 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 hard for people to do mm -hmm. and um uh yeah and and i understand that so so i am never angry at anybody i am angry yeah. at the situation and i keep that within myself yeah but yeah. for people still eating meat i understand why they do that yeah and the only possible way for me to change it is that i give them a choice of three in the future mm. and when you have the choice to cho choose a plant-based patty, an animal-based patty, or a cultivated meat patty, mm. it will probably make you think differently. And if I can say, okay, do you want to eat meat or do you absolutely need to de eat a dead animal? That's a different question. Right. And if we can make it convenient and easy for people to change their habits, uh -huh. um, then they probably will. And if we make it very hard and, 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 and socially disruptive for them and not accepted by their peers, it's not going to happen because people want to be safe within their communities. And if the community doesn't understand it and, and doesn't take to it, you as a single person understanding the importance, you really have to struggle to make that happen. And so what can we do to make it the norm? instead of the odd one out and and that's what i try to sort of work on and i am now 58 mm -hmm. and i will probably not see this happen um maybe my grandchildren will mm -hmm. and still if i don't do this the chance that my grandchildren will see this happen will never happen mm. so i feel as if i'm part of a big group that's building a cathedral for the future people to go to uh, and 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 have a better place. That's but I will not that. see this happen personally. No, it's truly, I think, a really uh, generous um, vision you have because when, you know, these things do take time, whether it's with, and I think this whole thing, I've heard it a couple of times with other aspects of life, with inclusion, with certain ways we treat, you know, other life forms and our own other human beings is this dignity of choice and then, you know, um, it, it's, it's really amazing that, you know, you're fighting for this. But I want to understand, um, when you talk about vegan diets, um, is, it, is, is it, is, are the long-term 
effects of a vegan diet? Have they been tested? And do people know what might happen? Because, and, and if at all, are there any negative uh, consequences to being a vegan and a plant-based diet? Because of course, you know, if you look at Netflix, you look at YouTube, there are always going to be videos like, what happened to me after eating a soy patty uh, will blow your mind. And the other one is like, what happened blew my mind and the person's mind got blown. But realistically, uh, being a vegan and also being around vegans and spreading the message of being a vegan, uh, what would you say to someone who's sitting on the fence or someone who, who is, you know, there's this word I'm sure called the militant vegans, right? Where no one wants to call them to parties. I, I don't know if you're one of them, but I'm sure you, you sound more tolerant than that. But what would you say to someone who's just heard about vegans and they're tired going, I'm tired of these vegans, but how do you approach the diet? And more importantly, have you, are you aware of any of the side effects or long-term consequences of being on a vegan diet? Um, I think, um, I don't know. Mm -hmm. And I don't think anybody knows. Um, right. I, I, if you look at human nature, um, and so it's, it's again, a question of balance. Mm -hmm. I believe that it is true that animal-based uh, uh, um, uh, protein is, is some, has benefits. Mm -hmm. But I'm also convinced that between having a glass of milk every day, having uh, 100 grams of meat every day, and having uh, scrambled eggs every day, or having a glass of milk once a week, mm. that's the difference. If yeah. we humans eat vegetables and grains and not too much salt and the right kind of fats, and we have an egg or a glass of milk or a piece of meat once a week or a couple of times uh, uh, in a, a month, hmm. that, is, that already is a drastic change. Absolutely. And of yeah. course, yeah. then if you have this sense within you that you don't want to take anything derived from an animal, even a letter or whatever. I, I love that because I understand it. Mm -hmm. But for the majority of people, it's more of a balancing your intake. And yeah. I am 100% uh, sure that even a 10% diet on a daily basis, animal derived is almost too much. Yeah. It's not necessary. It's not necessary for your health. It's not good for the climate. It's not good for anything. And especially yeah. if we need to have so much animals together, the next pandemic that we will derive from, again, probably from the way we treat animals or how we go about animals, 70% mm. of all the antibiotics used, used in the world is put into animals. Yeah they will probably not be in your meat, especially not here in the Netherlands. I am 100% sure that the, the meat that I eat in the Netherlands doesn't contain uh, antibiotics in itself. No, it but comes that to us animal tees it out and it's, it's in my environment. It's in my drinking water. It's in my ah, soil. Okay. It's everywhere. Right. And right now we have this pandemic uh, uh, called COVID. And one of the com pandemics coming our way, uh, and I've known this for, for since forever, is that we will be uh, we won't be able to use any antibiotics anymore, and that we will create a superbug yeah. that will kill us. Which might because, be a good thing for many people. <laughs> so, so if we want to talk health, mm. it's not so much the health that I have to worry about about the amount of um, a meat we eat or not, or a vegan yeah. diet or not the health thing that is very much in our face yeah. is the way we treat animals right now is only done with a lot of antibiotics. And that in itself yeah. is really, really detrimental to all of us. To the entire sort of environment. Yeah. Now, and you know, this is what I, you know, sometimes the, the larger picture, we get so caught up in the infighting that we forget that, Hey, it's, you know, if someone's looking at the earth as, as, as a show, they'll just be like, why aren't these guys getting the larger picture? They're so bothered about fighting within their own neighborhoods that they forget that there's this bigger thing that they're all coexisting on or try, they're supposed to coexist on, you know? Yeah. And it's, it's baffling. But, you know, even the fact that you mentioned uh, meat, 10% meat a day, I, I, I don't eat meat every day, maybe once a week, maybe if I go out twice a week, um, I've stopped milk, 
um, I do an, I do egg maybe. On, I mean, I'm not going to give you my entire diet, but what I'm trying to say is... No, please don't. Know, yeah, it's going to take a long time. <laughs> <laughs> no, but the, 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 the things... Okay, if I if you ask me a question, um, anybody sitting on the fence of becoming yes or no a vegan, uh-huh. one of the most annoying things that will happen to you if you actually become a vegan uh-huh. is that you go to people and then... Yeah, you sort of have to almost out yourself as the vegan in the room. Yeah. And then the whole dinner will be about my food choice or my being a vegan or them tra- trying to explain to me that they're a flexitarian or a vegan or a vegetarian <laughs> or they're a, a carnivore. Yeah. And as if I care. Yeah. Why is there so much thing? About I don't food? care what other people eat. I yeah. care about what I eat and it's my choice. And I don't really want to bother other people about what they eat i just yeah. want to provide them with a better choice in the future that's what i do i've never understood this people mock you like for, you, you've probably heard of goa right in uh, on the coast of india so when i used to go with friends they used to eat fish and they used to eat prawn and i i, I don't like eating seafood so i used to eat whatever you know like a, like a naan bread and a gravy like a veg or dal whatever and people like oh could you eat this in goa like and, and people use food as a way to mock and kind of big themselves up like I'm on a I'm on a carnivore diet I'm on a paleo diet and as you said just let me eat what I want <laughs> I mean why is yeah. food why are we differentiating why are we discriminating or whatever the word may be putting someone down or saying someone's cool because oh man he ate a 64 ounce steak you're gonna have some severe blockage in your pipes my friend if you eat 64 ounces of a cow it's crazy but and and but but it's okay with me i don't really care what other people eat at the table and i'm one of those vegans that if i go to dinner for Mm. instance if you would invite me to come over to dinner Uh uh, i will eat what you serve me Uh and of course if there's a piece of meat i will probably eat around it or not take it Mm -hmm. and if i take a bite of it i will eat it because i am not going to call you and say oh please will you take into account that i'm a vegan Mm. i just don't so I'm probably one of those practical vegans that just eats what at the but table where guys, and what's comfortable. Where do you guys hide? Because I haven't found too many of you. <laughs> no, no, no. Most are. And uh, so even within the vegan community, I'm also not okay, probably. I I, I don't know. Um, I but think I it's don't. that influence from Asia. I think there's that mix that you have going on with your yeah, dad's I, influence and I, I, all I, these things, which make you a, a practical human being, I think, not just vegan. <laughs> no, 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 I, I, I don't. And it took me a long time to to get to the point to 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 say it or to do it. Mm-hmm. Um, I never. Um, I, I think I used to be a flexitarian, and then mm-hmm. I always knew that I wanted to cut out milk and eggs mm. because I don't like the industry. Yeah. And um, and lo and behold, I was able to do it because I always had the sense that I couldn't. I I thought it was too difficult. It would be yeah. too. Uh, uh intrusive and as a matter of fact yeah it it is mind-boggling because suddenly if you change the supermarket isn't the same place as it was before everything looks different uh, it's not for you um yeah. having to read labels on a pot or, or or cartons it's like i something i just bought food and now yeah, i have yeah. to take it into so it's it's not the easy choice hmm. but for me the way i do it it's the comfortable choice and um it made me aware of a lot of things that i sort of put out of my thinking so i was consciously Mm -hmm. trying to avoid the topic of animal abuse animal slaughter animal uh, torture stuff like that because i knew it but I didn't, I chose not to think about it. Yeah. So I wonder, but I'm a fun person. No, you sound and this uh, what I very know, nice. Is, and, and if I come to dinner, I'll, I'll behave. And if you <laughs> eat a steak in front of me, I still like you. So yeah. uh, nobody on the podcast, uh, uh, please um, just let me do what I want to do. And I will let others do what they want to do yeah and i hope they will like the fact that i am working very very hard to make sure that what gets to their table and the future of culture and the future of food as something that we give to children and use in our family becomes even better yeah 
I think there's a lot of sick people out there. It's a better meat than our current meat. Uh, yeah. uh, Plant-based uh, foods are better than uh, animal-derived foods in so yeah. many ways. So I'm, I'm quite positive and I'm very looking forward to new tastes also. I think, yeah. and if you look at the narrative of food, I think nobody wants to go back a hundred years. Yeah. Right yeah. now, we yeah. have the best possible food in our stores, in our supermarket. We have extremely nicely designed stuff. Yeah. And I am sort of like, yeah, well, we will probably have even better foods and funnier foods and even new tastes yeah, in the yeah, next yeah. hundred years. I think that's and culture I can't wait for them to go to the supermarket and be, of course, healthier and better for the environment. So I'm working towards a better food system than we currently have which is really, really important and amazing that you're doing it without just putting your head down, going about it, doing it, which is great. So on that note, can you just tell my listeners about the work and the intention of Kind Earth Tech, what you do and why you do it? Of course, we know the big why, but how you go about it? <laughs> well, um, well, I have, um, of course, I now know you as well, but I have an amazing friend and her name is Olivia Fox Caban. Mm -hmm. And she lives in California. She originally is from France and mm -hmm. she is a firecracker, extremely intelligent. And she started working on um, alternative proteins, making industry maps quite mm -hmm. some years ago. Mm -hmm. And then she started doing a show and she invited me and we started thinking about it. And we're just two women with wild ideas mm -hmm. who found a lot of the, um, let's say, shows around food very boring. Right. And we wanted to do them in our own way with a twist. And we have a standing uh, appointment, you and I, because the next show that I will do, mm -hmm. I will use you to put in some humor because I think we need humor and anger and fun and and beauty artists and because food is something that we all need there's it's not something that only when you're in a really bad situation you can't take food but everybody needs food yeah so it's universal and i believe people are universally different mm -hmm. so you have all kinds of people all kind of uh, cultures Taste and all kind yeah. of takes yeah. And that is what we want to bring into the, uh, let's say, uh, a, a power cooker that is called Kind Earth Tech yeah. to sort of tickle all your brain cells. So yeah. not only the knowledge part yeah. of your brain cells, but also how it will taste, how it will smell, how mm -hmm. you can serve it to your family, how it is made, uh, where it comes from. Um, and, and we look at everybody that we bring to the stage mm -hmm. is what is the content and mm -hmm. how can we help that person to create the best content for the audience. Mm -hmm. And our main goal is to sort of tickle the brain in a, a very diverse way so that if you've been to a kind of tech event, mm -hmm. you get, go away with something that you can take home and do the next day or right. that you take home something that you can actually take action on or that you can take home something that you are so enthusiastic about that you will tell everybody. And that is how we design the events. That's mm -hmm. how we incorporate amazing people that do amazing tech for the future. Mm -hmm. And it is just a fun project for us to do because that is the kind of events we would like to go to if somebody else would design them. And that is how yeah. CAT uh, uh, came to be. That's what we still like to do. We just had an amazing one in uh, in uh, um, uh, Singapore. Uh -huh. It was organized by uh, uh, the team of uh, Zandia. Mm -hmm. And she is actually the lady that now has done the first tastings there of crustaceans and mm -hmm. crab. And uh, um, so you can also have from cultivated, cultivated meat? crab meat in the future hey, or okay, cultivated okay. lobster in the future now you don't like that i'm sorry but <laughs> no 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 that, that that's you know pardon the pun but that's just me being shellfish you know <laughs> 
So and 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 um, uh, hopefully That's I will so cool. be able to do the next show in Amsterdam, Paris, and Madrid, mm. and use the current techniques that we have to make in a hybrid event, so that when you're in Spain, you can actually stay at home or be at the event and see what's happening in Amsterdam. Yeah. So it's a, a simultaneously hybrid in-person event. Nice. And we will talk about the culinary uh, qualities of the future of food because mm -hmm. somehow food has these days been connected too much to the environment and, yeah. and a bit of future whereas for me food is tasty and fun and being with my family or yeah. inviting friends and if we don't make sure that future food are also seen as tasty fun nutritious uh uh, uh nice um so that's what we're going to talk about next and if we see that we need to talk about something else the uh then we'll organize and design another event around it uh and and highlight that so that's what we do how cool no because i like this you know why on one one end of course meat is food but you're also saying you know just because it's it's even if you look at it away from food what you're doing to these animals which eventually end up on your plate what you're doing to them and treating them is bad in, in independent of whether you eat them or not so it's it's good to know and while you're eating this idea that food is shouldn't be demonized and eating eating there is an option of um protein animal uh, cultivated yeah. meat so you don't have to be denied or deprived of certain tastes and food preferences so it's really cool in fact i read a line which I, i'm not able to uh, remember but there's a really good tagline to your company on the website um is it something to do with food tech uh, it says for kind of tech there's a really nice line at the bottom of your web page um something which says um i can obviously put it down in the description later i don't know but if you remember it um a line i don't remember it there are so many tech lines on my website yeah. <laughs> i have no clue right. um there's something to do with food technology for the future or something along those lines it's really yeah um important well, there's, there's, a, there's another tagline that i like and that is i don't like the fact that i have to fight an existing system I just want to build something that is more appealing to everybody and then that will become the new system and that's what yeah. I want to do. I think that's a great way of looking at it and I think that's fantastic because instead of breaking down the existing framework you're just building a new one why should you even try to fight that fight yeah you know um, Ira I think that's incredible work and I hope you can come to India one day and uh, I'll be happy to join you remotely and contribute with my one vegan joke. Would you like to hear it? Yeah, I, so, I, I was missing your jokes. Uh, so please give me a no, joke. My, it's, it's a horrible joke. I'm going to give you a disclaimer right now, but the horrible joke goes like uh, a vegan ended up going for a conference. What I wonder is, did they start it off with a meet and greet? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I'm, I'm terribly I sorry. I like that one. I like yeah, that one. I'm going to remember one. that one. You can use it in schools. You can use it in colleges, in all forums. <laughs> well, for anybody right now thinking of becoming a vegan, please do. But don't take yourself overly serious. Take this. Please take this joke home with you. Yeah. And, and, and make sure that you have fun. That's well put, and I'm okay. glad it's coming from you because you are. Can you still can you still hear me? Because somebody is making an enormous amount of noise here, and I can't make them stop. <laughs> I can hear you. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I have these neighbors, as I told you, who are sledgehammering okay, away. Okay. But I think we'll we'll take that as a point to end this conversation. But it's of course just the beginning, and uh, I really appreciate you joining me on this episode, Ira. It's been a while since we have been meaning to do this, but I'm yeah. so glad we met on Clubhouse. Uh, people can visit your website, which is kindearthtech.net, right? No, it is kindearth.tech. Okay, kind earth. That's right. I knew I had something wrong. Kindearth.tech. I'll put all the details. You can follow Ira on uh, social media. I'll list those in the description as well. And congratulations on everything you're doing. Thank you. And uh, thanks for sharing your story on the Sophie Rao Show, Ira. My pleasure. And if you can send any farmers in the world that want to make cultivated meat and know mm -hmm. how they can be a part of this, mm -hmm. my way, that would be so welcoming because cultivated meat is not only going to come from large factories. Uh -huh. I want to make sure that everybody who is now a farmer will be able to make cultivated meat to feed uh, their families, to feed, feed the world and be part of this new ecosystem. 
Brilliant. I might just take you up on that and I will put out the word and hopefully anyone listening to this right now, if you don't know anyone or if you are that person, do reach out to Ira. You can get all her details on the website. And if you want to get in touch with her, if you can't find her details, you can contact me. So thank you. I really appreciate it. Okay. And see you next time uh, on one of our shows, providing yeah, yeah. the humor that we so badly need if we take ourselves too seriously. Okay. Bye. Absolutely. Bye. Bye. Thank bye. you very much. Thank you, Ira. Take care. Bye.